So by way of introduction, I'm Barney Ely, Director of our Hayes Human Resources Specialism. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Ed Mills, partner at Travers Smith and Adam Rice, professional support lawyer at Travers, and Jeff Borsick, Director of Hayes Project Solutions. Um, so there's a lot of uh, interest in the subject matter, which is not surprising given the, the current circumstances. And over the next 45 minutes to an hour, uh, we'll do our best to further your knowledge uh, of it um, and uh, do that from a, a number of different angles. Um, please note that we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, um, so be sure to write any questions you have in the question box on the right-hand side of the screen at any point during the presentation, and then we will answer, do our best to answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. So as HR professionals, we clearly recognize that the workplace is changing in many ways, and we know that this change is set to be constant uh, in its speedy evolution. Um, we have choice of whether we are reactive to it or proactive, and I would suggest that having knowledge and understanding of the key developments is the platform to lead and guide our organizations in benefiting from these changes. So just to say there are many changes uh, that we have witnessed in the workplace recently. Uh, two significant ones are the rise of the gig economy, hence the reason why we are having this webinar, uh, and secondly, the change in market forces in permanent hiring. Um, they may appear opposite as one is focused on our permanent employees and the other on our workers, contractors, self-employed, the gig side um, that provides services to our organizations. But the two are connected and intertwined. To explain this, it's interesting to look at why the gig economy has risen. Um, and it can be crudely be attributed in three broad causes. Firstly, technological development. And this is including the internet, social media, which has made it a lot easier for people to communicate and advertise their services and skills. And the effect uh, of technology on remote working, so making it possible for people not to be based in the office and provide services remotely. The second cause is uh, the, the choice of um, the people, of what they want for their work-life balance and what they want their life to look like. Whether that be lifestyle choice, work-life balance, um, and also that's been influenced by the affluence of the older skilled workforce, giving them choice of how they earn their income in the latter stages of, of their careers. The third cause, we could put down broadly economic reasons. Um, the recession um, that we have come out of um, uh, meant that employers needed to reduce costs at that time, and permanent employment was seen as relatively expensive investment. Uh, there, there was and there continues to be productivity pressures, um, and uh, this has meant that efficiency gains were needed to be found, and still so in the workplace. And workers could receive high reward for gig work compared to permanent employment. And that remains not necessarily so much in the public services, but certainly in the private sector, and Jeff will talk more about that uh, later on in the presentation. And finally, um, the final cause is the continued skills shortages, where supply in labor market does not match demand, and also the significant change in the skills profiles required by organizations. So that final reason is a contributing factor to the rise of the gig economy, and has also meant that hiring of employees has become more difficult, particularly in niche or specialist skills, skilled professions. To put some context in this, this is a couple of slides from uh, our Hayes UK salary guide. Um, and what this slide shows is that 77% of employers say their top challenge when recruiting is the shortage of suitable applicants. And where is the demand? So I've talked about the changing demand of organizations uh, and the lack of supply of that. Well, it's prevalent across functions in leadership and managerial skills. And then, unsurprisingly, in professions that we would see as a natural ground of the gig workers, projects and change, IT infrastructure, data, and analytics. And there's significant impact that skill shortages are having. As you can see from the slide, 59% of employers say that suitable a uh, shortage of suitable applicants is negatively affecting productivity, and clearly uh, productivity has been a main um, 
uh, issue in the economy over the last number of years, um, and you can see the impact on growth, business development, and ultimately on revenue and profit. So what are organisations and HR professionals doing proactively in, in these circumstances? Gaining a clear understanding of the gig economy and the benefits of it. Um, we will do this uh, uh, at a, 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 a further in this, um, in this presentation, but that gaining of that clear understanding is very important, and the organisations that are on the front foot and those HR professionals that are mirroring that are certainly really uh, deep in their understanding of how organisations can benefit from the gig economy. But this cannot be done in isolation, as most organisations will need to operate with the right balance of permanent employees and resources from the gig economy. So first, I'll take a brief look at what the solutions is to permanent hiring in this challenging market. I quite like this slide because it, it probably uh, tracks my career uh, in uh, resourcing and, and recruitment uh, from pre-internet uh, to the current day when I started in, in recruitment in the early 90s. Um, so there's certainly been an evolution in, in the recruitment and, and resourcing industry, whether that be in-house or, or agency. Um, and there's been much debate recently on how technology has changed the recruitment industry. Uh, as a result of digitalization. Consumers or candidates are increasingly expecting businesses will find them, and employers are finding it harder to find valuable talent quickly or are negatively being impacted by the additional noise generated by digitalization. The diagram highlights the key development milestones along the traditional advertise and apply world of recruitment from pre-internet being reliant on print advertisement and candidates mailing in their CVs, to the introduction of job boards and social media and being able to apply online. Despite the changes that have happened in the industry, the one thing that has remained constant is the need for recruitment expertise, whether that be in-house or external supply. In the model of advertise and apply, where uh, that is defined by the candidate finding a job ad via a job board, employers can be inundated with online applications of unqualified candidates for their adverts, thereby making the process more cumbersome. Further to this, the widely sought after passive candidate audiences are unlikely to be exposed to a job advert as they are not likely searching roles on a job board. And finally, attracting in-demand skills in candidate short markets remains to be a challenge unless one has existing relationship with target audiences and deep sector specific understanding of candidates main career drivers. To help address these challenges, Hayes has developed an approach that becomes, uh, balances the art and science of recruitment in a way that can identify candidates more effectively, and we call that find and engage. So balancing the art and human touch of recruitment with the investment in leading technology, data science and machine learning um, enables organizations to match the best talent to their client needs. So find and engage is defined whereby the candidate is found, recruiters use resourcing tools and data analytics to help prepare shortlists that also encompass passive job seekers using more than just an applicant application to identify if a prospective candidate is approachable. Fundamentally, Find and Engage is a result of significant developments in data, artificial intelligence and digital technology. And why finding and engage is different to advertise and apply is because advertise and apply can only indicate candidates' immediate interest and approachability. Market forces mean that finding and engage model is becoming the new MO for the recruitment of specialist skills. So we've looked at the permanent side of employment. Now let's look at the second major impact that the labor market has experienced, the continued rise of the flexible workforce and specifically the emergence of the gig economy. Um, the gig economy is a relatively new term and the data around it is varied at best. So let's try and define it as best we can. So essentially, uh, its name from each piece of work being akin to an individual gig. It is also frequently referred to as the sharing economy or the collaborative economy or the platform economy, thanks to its increasing number of app-based platforms that offer gig work. However, not all gig economy roles are based around a digital platform. Gig economy workers increasingly work for more traditional companies. 
This includes the idea of portfolio working, a phrase that describes people who work on a number of different projects or different organisations, sometimes combining such activity with other more formal employment. Essentially, despite the common assumption, gig workers are not only limited to those on temporary contracts and have a number of jobs that could be characterised as insecure, low-skilled and often low-paid work, the group is also comprised of highly skilled, sought-after talent that is relatively well-paid and expects to work flexibly. Of course, there are some blurred lines between the specific differences between gig workers and contracted employees, which Adam and Ed will hopefully expand on for us from a law perspective. Now, while it is um, undeniable that technology is contributing to the increasing prevalence of the gig economy, it also is being driven by growing numbers of workers keen to take more control of their careers. This has traditionally been associated with millennials and their unique work preferences, but it is a misconception that the group are the sole recipients of gig work. There is mounting interest among older employees many of whom are moving towards the end of their career and looking for more flexible ways of working. When we look at the exact numbers of those in the gig economy in the UK, the data varies. According to 2017 parliamentary report, 15% of UK workers are self-employed, some 5 million people. But not all of these will be in what we consider the gig economy, as this also covers traditional freelance roles and contractors. While the Chartered Institute of Personal Development estimates that there are 1.3 million Britons employed in the gig economy, um, whereas a report produced by the Department of Business, Energy and Industry Strategy in 2018 found that 4.4% of the population of the UK had worked in the gig economy in the last 12 months, roughly 2.8 million people. However, despite these discrepancies, it is still uh, early days for the gig economy, so these figures are likely to rise and we can take any guide from the US, 20% of workers uh, in the gig economy in the US earned over £100,000 uh, each last year. As I said at the beginning, we have a choice to be reactive or proactive. Being informed is the platform for the proactive choice. What are the challenges and opportunities for HR professionals and why should they take a strategic lead on the changes the gig economy is set to bring. The gig economy can undoubtedly bring a huge degree of flexibility to the way companies and professionals work. For employees, that provides a unique for employers, sorry, that provides a unique opportunity to reduce overheads and be more agile, particularly during peak periods or one off projects. However, there is the potential for workers to receive less protection and fair pay. Taylor Review, which Adam and Ed will discuss, hopes to address this discontent. However, it is clear that many HR departments are not prepared for the rise of the gig economy and therefore are not ready to take advantage of the opportunities that come with the gig economy. A 2016 PwC report showed that many HR departments are failing to get to grips with the issues. It found that less than one third of employers are based, basing their future talent strategies on the rise of the portfolio career, even though a huge 46% of HR professionals expect that at least 20% of their workforce to be made up of contractors and temporary workers by 2020. In light of the future changes the gig economy is set to bring, HR departments should look to take on a more strategic role and lead on how they can use gig economy workers to create real transformation and drive their business forward. So that's by way of introduction and a framework for our further discussions on the Taylor uh, report. So I'd like to hand over and introduce Ed and Adam from Travis Smith. Thank Thanks you, very much. Uh, thanks, Barney. Thanks very much indeed. Ed Mills kicking off first. I'm head of the employment team at Travis Smith and joined by Adam Rice, who's one of the senior associates in, in the team. And I think it's fair to say that the gig economy employment status is a really, really big issue in our team at the moment, probably almost as big as GDPR, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> as Barney said, um, Adam and I are going to look at some of the employment law challenges raised by the gig economy and also the recommendations arising from the recent Taylor review. A lot of the focus in the press cases and the review itself has been around the uncertainty in terms of what rights gig economy workers have. Are they employees or are they self-employed or are they in this intermediate category of worker? 
And I think, uh, Adam, it's probably worth us reminding ourselves of the different categories of employment status from the get-go. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, so there are currently three different categories. So these are the three ways an individual might provide their services to a business. Um, obviously, the most common um, is uh, employment or employee status, and employees benefit from the full range of employment rights. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have um, the self-employed, so people who are effectively operating a business on their own account and who typically provide their services to lots of different clients. Then in the middle, you have what Ed just described as this hybrid or intermediate category of worker, someone who's not really self-employed, but not quite an employee either. You've got the categories there on the slide, but in reality, the diagram looks a lot more like this. Um, and that's because all employees are workers, but not all workers are employees. So the worker category is perhaps the broadest category, encompassing anyone who's not um, self-employed. Now, the big issue in the gig economy is that individuals are typically engaged on a self-employed basis and treated as self-employed contractors. But there's been um, a string of recent cases where tri tribunals have said that a number of gig economy workers are not genuinely self-employed, but they're workers, they fall within this intermediate category, and they have certain employment rights. Okay, good, good, good enough so far, but how do you distinguish someone as a worker, what's the test? And, and surely it must be quite easy to apply. <laughs> we, we think so, Ed. Um, the, the test, unfortunately, can be quite difficult to apply in practice. Um, so the definition is a worker is broadly someone who works under a contract of personal service where the other party to the contract is not a customer or client of theirs. So breaking that down a bit, there needs to be some sort of contract. That's your first um, hurdle. Um, and secondly, that contract has to be one of personal service, i.e. where the individual is required to do the work themselves. And the third requirement then is that the individual is not genuinely self-employed. So they're not operating a business or profession on their own account, and um, they're not providing services to clients of that business or profession. Okay, so personal service is key. And actually, the Deliveroo case is one outlier in the gig economy where riders were held to be genuinely self-employed, and it all hinged on personal service or lack of it. You see, Deliveroo riders are allowed to subcontract deliveries or send a substitute to do deliveries for them, and they don't need to get Deliveroo's approval or even let Deliveroo know. So this means that riders are not obliged to perform the work themselves, personally, which is a basic requirement of worker status. That's absolutely right, Ed. So where the individual doesn't have a right to subcontract or to send someone else to do their work, then there is the necessary personal service element, and that individual is more likely to be a worker. Now, you might think um, one easy way to get around worker status is to let people subcontract out their work or to provide a substitute. Now, obviously, that works for Deliveroo but it wouldn't necessarily work for every business because by doing that, you lose some control. So delivery loses control because riders can farm out work to other people who haven't been interviewed or trained by the company. So it's not always going to work commercially. Indeed. And just to recap on those worker rights, as Adam said, workers have some basic employment rights, but not all of them. For example, workers have the right to be paid the national minimum wage and the right to pay statutory holiday as well as rights like whistleblower protection and auto-enrolment for pensions. But importantly, they don't have the right to claim for unfair dismissal, that's only for employees, and no right to notice pay or redundancy pay on termination of an engagement. So Adam, this brings us on to the Taylor Review itself. Can you please explain what that's all about and what's changing here, if indeed anything is changing? Sure, yeah, and that's a good point, Ed, because the first thing to say here is that nothing has changed yet, um, and while there are lots of proposals, they are very much in the early stages, so it's going to be a little while before we see concrete change here. But to give you the background, um, the Taylor Review was commissioned back in 2016 when the government appointed Matthew Taylor um, to lead an independent review into employment law, and the focus of the review was to consider 
whether employment law needs to change, really, to keep up with these new business models that Barney was talking about, new ways of working, um, in particular the gig economy. Um, the review published its findings last year, uh, making a number of recommendations for reform. In fact, um, it made 53 recommendations for changes. Then earlier this year, the government responded to the Taylor Review, essentially saying it agrees in principle with the vast majority of the recommendations, but it's now consulting over the proposals and how best to implement them before going ahead. So back in February this year, the government published four different consultation papers um, about taking forward the recommendations. One of those is all about increasing clarity on employment status and worker status. Another focuses on um, greater transparency over worker rights. Um, there's a separate paper about enforcement of those rights, and then a fourth um, focuses on some changes in relation to agency workers. Okay, so you'll be pleased to know that we're not going to look at all 53 recommendations today. Just a handful of the key proposals that we think are worth highlighting. Adam, what are the key proposals for the gig economy? Yeah, well, the main proposal here is all around um, clarity on worker status. As I said earlier, it's not always clear to determine whether someone's genuinely self-employed or a worker or indeed an employee. Um, and one of the big issues from the review was that both employers and individuals find it difficult to know what someone's status is. So the government's looking at clarifying this, and they're looking to clarify the tests in legislation. In relation to worker status, they want to move away from the focus being on personal service, as in the delivery case that you mentioned earlier, Ed, to a situation where the key factors are how much control the company has over the individual and how dependent the individual is on the company for work. And the government's even thinking about renaming this category as dependent contractor. Not set in stone, but it's something that they are considering at the moment. Yes, and the government is also considering an online tool for employment status. Now, we know from experience in areas like the off-payroll um, IR35 rules that Jeff will come on to talk about, that online tools don't always work very well for employment status. There are too many subtleties and complexities. So whilst we're all for greater clarity, we don't necessarily think an online tool is the best way forward here. We've actually thought long and hard about this, and we'll be responding to the consultation on behalf of our clients. But we're starting to come to the view that the current system is, has been, and will remain workable. So our message will essentially be, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Whilst there are, of course, some very sensible aspects to the proposals, we would caution the government to be careful um, what you wish for. Um, Wholesale changes are probably likely to lead to more confusion and uncertainty. But of course, this is all subject to consultation at the moment. Adam, when are we likely to hear more? Well, the consultation on employment status and clarifying the test for worker status that I mentioned closes on the 1st of June this year. Um, and the other consultations all close sometime in May. But I suspect it's going to be towards um, the very end of summer perhaps even autumn, at the very earliest, before we hear more about what the government's sort of fixed plans are here. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the government, of course, has plenty of other things on its plate at the moment with Brexit and so forth, so any material changes are probably a little way off. Absolutely. Okay, so what else is the government proposing? Well, another um, key concern arising from the Taylor Review was the lack of stability for workers in the gig economy, um, particularly those who um, work on casual or zero-hours contracts, those in sort of insecure employment um, uh, is the term that Bar Barney mentioned earlier. So the government's planning to introduce a right to request a more stable contract, um, perhaps after a certain period, like 12 months. So how this might work is if um, you're a zero-hours worker, but you regularly work, say, 20 hours a week um, for a gig economy employer over an extended period, you could then write to your employer and say you want to move to a 20-hour contract to reflect your, your current working pattern. And the employer would then have to consider it and come up with some fairly good reasons if it decided not to, to offer you the contract. Okay, that makes sense. But what about pay? 
We know workers are entitled to the national minimum wage, but one of the big problems in the gig economy is how do you decide when someone's working, what hours should be paid. One suggestion is that workers should be paid whenever they're logged onto the app, ready to work. But then you have issues with people working for lots of different platforms who might be logged on to multiple apps. Also, you might get people logging on in the middle of the night when demand is low, so they know they're getting paid when they won't have much to do. How's the government addressing that? Yeah, good question. There are no easy answers here, um, but the government is certainly alive to the issue. So part of the consultation is going to be to try to define more clearly what hours should be paid for national minimum wage purposes for gig economy workers. And the government's essentially seeking views on that. Um, as you mentioned, the cases so far have tended to suggest that it should be when the worker is logged on to the app and ready to work. There are clearly some problems with that. Um, another suggestion from the Taylor Review is that workers in the gig economy could be paid per task, um, say per delivery or per piece produced. And there is actually currently a mechanism that allows you to do that. Um, so what you can do as a gig economy employer is work out how many tasks the average worker completes in an hour, then um, calculate how much you would need to pay per task to ensure the average worker gets at least the national minimum wage, and then you pay per task. But in doing that, you have to build in a bit of a buffer. So you need to make sure you're paying um, a rate per task, which allows the average worker to earn at least 1.2 times the national minimum wage. And that essentially allows for um, workers who are learning or developing um, who are, or who are slightly slower than average. And you might have seen when the Taylor Review was published, this is one of the, the headlines around um, the, the rate for national minimum wage for gig economy workers, the 1.2 or the 120% the hourly rate um, for, national minimum workers, uh, for national minimum wage purposes. Finally, um, on the proposals here, the government's proposing there should be a lot more transparency and information um, provided to workers about their rights. So a couple of things are being planned. Um, from April next year, April 2019, employers are going to be required to provide written statements of employment terms for all workers, not just employees. So as you probably know, at the moment, employers have to provide a written statement of um, employment particulars to all employees. That's going to be extended to cover workers as well. Employers will also be required to provide pay slips for workers, not just employees. And uh, for workers that are paid by the hour, the pay slip will have to include a breakdown of hourly rates um, and, and whether different hourly rates for overtime and things like that, that will have to be specified in the pay slip. All of that, of course, is going to be backed up with an awareness campaign about worker rights. So we're going to see a lot more government guidance and perhaps publicity around this in the coming months and years. That's right. So on this slide, you've got the exact timings of the various consultations, um, but what can you be doing now as employers? Well, firstly, a good idea to review the different types of workers you engage, decide if they're in the right bucket, uh, look at the contractual documents as part of, of this to make sure that they fit the reality. Perhaps this is an exercise you'll pick up with your recruiters. Um, and then secondly, really just keep an eye out for the changes that come in. But as I said before, we don't think that uh, necessarily the broad framework should or indeed will change. It's more likely to be tinkering around the edges. And of course, we'll be keeping a watching eye on things and keeping Hayes and others up to date. More and on in the Employment Law Bulletin we produce in conjunction with Hayes. So, um, Passing over to Jeff now, Jeff's going to pick up a topic we've touched on, and that's the thorny issue or not of IR35. <laughs> Thank you for the thorny issue. Um, thanks, Ed and Adam. Um, I thought it was very worthwhile as um, closing this just to touch on um, IR35. Um, I think it's worth flagging this potential uh, legislative change um, on this, on the growing gig economy that we're seeing. And fundamentally, we think that um, this could change the way that contractors are hired and, and utilised within the private sector. And we've already seen this change uh, impact uh, into the public sector. So very quickly, I'll cover, I'll cover four things with you. 
give you a bit of an overview on um, the background to IR35 and, and how it's rolled in over the last, I suppose, 18 years technically. Um, look at the potential impact that we uh, can foresee into the private sector, and really that's from the basis of what we saw the impact being in, in the public sector. Um, and then to look at the you know, potential solutions you could start um, looking at, um, and finally just some plans and, and groundwork you could you could do with probably a year to go before this um, before this um, kicks into into in, into place. So. Um, IR35, quick quick overview, um, and for those of you who have been contractors and, and, and paid under a PSC in the past, you'll be broadly familiar with this or, or very familiar with this. Um, it was introduced in, um, in 2000, um, and ultimately the, the mission behind the HMRC <coughs> was, was looking at this perceived sort of tax avoidance by uh, PSC um, workers. Um, and very much this was aimed at the, at the individual. Um, and to date, the HMRC has had a, um, a very, very poor track record in, in challenging uh, individuals uh, of any a scale or si a significance, although you may have seen some recent, um, recent examples within, within the BBC being flagged. Um, but what we actually saw, the major change which occurred um, in April 2017, was this um, fairly quick and fast launch um, into, into the public sector um, of, of payroll working, whereby we saw the owners change from it going to the contractor, and the contractor was, was, was held, held liable ultimately to the organization being um, held, held accountable. Um, so that rolled in fairly quick um, from the, you know, I guess, important statement and rolled through uh, quickly and, and, and took light in 2017. Um, our view is that it's likely, although not confirmed yet, that the uh, impact into the, into the private sector will hit in April 2019. Um, so that's the overview of, of, um, of the background to IR35. Um, what do we see the impact, um, potential impact being into the private sector? And really this, this, this opinion is based on what we saw happen in the public sector, and when it hit the public sector, um, the initial um, uh, impact was very severe, and I think we've seen over the last six months organizations changing their view and changing their stance. Um, but ultimately, what did we see? Well, we saw a loss of, um, of significant contingent workforce move um, out, of, out of public sector and out of programs. And again, we're saying this could be the case into, uh, into organizations. And many organizations in the public sector found it difficult to um, actually bring people on board for significant projects. And, and some projects actually sort of collapsed under the lack of, uh, under the lack of resource. Um, so we saw that, and that could potentially be an impact in the private sector. Um, we saw potential cost increase, um, so as, um, potential uh, PSC workers had to move to PAYE. There is a, a significant um, cost increase that goes, uh, that goes with that. So again, that could be, a, that could be a, a, an impact. Um, the third point really is, is, um, is, a, is, a, you know, is a risk factor because you know, if you don't know and you haven't um, looked at how many contractors are in your organization um, and how are they getting Paid, um, there is a, a, a very, a very real risk that can um, that become become apparent. And still to this day, it does surprise me at, at the number of um, household names who are unaware of their contractor population, and secondly, how that contractor population are being engaged and being and being rewarded. Um, so there's a re very real um, financial risk um, and. Um, um, and, and, and underpinning risk there. Um, and I think the fourth, the fourth point really is that, in a more positive light, is if you get this right, um, non-permanent workforce can be engaged in a, a better and perhaps more productive way. Um, so you know, our advice around, uh, around a lot of this is onboarding uh, contractors in a more output-based way, which is how they, how they, how they should be, um, and by 
and by doing so, surely you get a better output from the workers that you do engage in this in this manner. Um, so, ultimately, what are the challenges and opportunities for an HR and, and leadership um, teams, um, and, and what should they look at in terms of um, you know in terms of onboarding people into you know into 2019? I've basically broken this down under, I suppose, three different. Um, uh, categories. So I'm saying, you know, firstly, for those of you who either know or think um, that you have in excess of 50 um, temporary or um, interim interim workers, you know, it is worth considering um, a managed service provision and perhaps somebody to um, look at that on your on your be on your behalf. Um, thereby, you should assume if you are dealing with a um, a, a strong um, and reputable uh, managed service provider that they can de-risk a lot of this, um, a lot of this for you. Um, if you're looking at projects, is there a move towards hiring under a statement of work and hiring a, uh, um, hiring a, um, a you know, a team under uh, under that under that manner, um, which is very much a, 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 an option we're seeing a number of, or have seen a number of the public sector. Organisations um, starting to starting to move down, um, and then you know the third point I would make: whichever um, recruiters you're you're dealing with on an ad hoc basis, if you're if you're starting to hire just ones and twos, and your numbers aren't you know significant, you know ensure you're dealing with uh, you know an organisation who can support you with um, with the decisions on that. Um, so ultimately, you know you do need to look at you know minimising minimising the risk position. So. Um, you know, what are the next steps? And as I say, I think you know, at this moment in time, we are strongly of the view this will land within within 11 months. Um, you know, do you have uh, you know contractors now that you that are uh, critical and will still be with you um, beyond that? Um, and you know, if so, you know, it, it's key that you're you're looking at this. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is. You know, can you agree an internal owner around this? Um, as we all know, under under you know hiring permanently, ultimately it falls under an HR director. But who owns um, non-perm workforce in an organisation? And quite often uh, that definition isn't isn't quite there. Um, IR 35, we're discovering that a lot of obviously the, the tax the you know the tax. Um, uh, leadership team understand it, but where does you know where does that go? So I think you know ultimately you know it needs to be assigned a you know an internal owner um, who's going to look at this project from an organisation, and then following that uh, there needs to be a data gathering exercise. You know what is the spend? What's the level of contractor workforce in your organisation? There's many benefits I think beyond IR35 of, of, of knowing this. Um, you know can you reduce cost and are there other um, you know the compliance matters you need to you need you need to look at risk matters you need to look at. So there's a data gathering exercise. Um, can an audit be done of that? And that's something that um, you know um, ourselves and, and, and other providers should be able to do on your behalf. Um, and from there, is there a stakeholder group? Who are the most significantly impacted uh, key owners in here? And we're often seeing that. You know, for example, the you know the CIO community is typically a big you know big user of, of, of you know contractor workforce, and I think it's 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 those um, individuals need to understand it and the the risk and as I say opportunity of that, and then there's the proposing of a of, of a solution. So as I say, I know it's only 11 months you know 11 months away, but you know time you know time runs fast on these typically runs fast on these things. So um, I do think there's, there's there's significant next steps to. Uh, to, to cover. Barney. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adam and Ed. And we have a number of questions in um, that we're just going to go through. Just pulling those up now. So there's a question here about um, rolling out of the IR35 rules into the private sector, and um, uh, as Jeff said, the government's committed to consulting on um, the rollout um, to the private sector. Question is, when would the consultation document need to be published for legislation to be effective from April uh, 2019? 
Um, it's a good question because there's no real set time frame that the government works towards on consultations. We sometimes see consultations running for um, a month, sometimes three months. Um, uh, we certainly think there would need to be a consultation this year, um, probably um, in the early part of the second half of the year, um, in order for the government to get the legislation out in time for it to be effective. I think that's, that's the smart, the smart money is probably on sort of September around yeah. that, that time. Um, I mean, they said uh, in the March statement it would be in the coming months, so query what that means. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier on in, in this session, they've got a hell of a lot on their plates at the moment, so um, it wouldn't surprise us if things are delayed a little bit beyond then. Um, you know, there has been a recent practice of bringing in legislation um, fairly late in the day with limited consultation. So watch this space, but as I say, we'll, we'll do all we can to keep our finger on the pulse and obviously keep people updated as quickly as we know anything. I mean, I think it, just, to, just to add to that, it went, obviously it went fairly quickly into, into public sector. It was only really, I think, in terms of what exactly it was, they had about six weeks, six weeks notice, which um, probably you know, stemmed some of the reaction to it. Um, I think added to whether it will happen or not. I think one of the big arguments is that, you know, you can't leave the gap for more than two years. You know, in terms of the the, the, the the impact between private and private and public sector. So, um, you know, I say without us being categoric, it, it happening. It, it from from our opinion, all points lead lead, lead that way to April. They do, although I, mean, I think you know, I would add into the mix that there are lots of eminent minds who have raised a number of concerns about sure. this. You know, from a policy point of view and from an implementation point of view. And I think the lobby group. Um, that sort of has risen up and continues to rise up against this is far more powerful and far better informed than we were a year and a bit ago when things yeah. were coming into the public sector. So it's not a done deal, um, but you know there's a certain direction of travel here, isn't there? That I think we all have to acknowledge. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've got another question here on IR35, and the question is: Who is responsible for IR35 compliance? Um, including tax compliance, is it the company or the contractor? Um, it's a good question. I mean, this goes to the heart of the off-payroll IR35 rules that Jeff was talking about. So at the moment, in the private sector, um, the individual contractor who supplies their services through a limited company is responsible for determining whether IR35 applies and then operating any necessary um, income tax, national insurance arrangements under that. What the, um, the public sector rules that were introduced in April this year did was to m remove the responsibility from the contractor's company and place it on the client um, who the services are supplied to to determine whether IR35 applies or not. And then if IR35 applies, it's the client who's got to deduct the income tax and national insurance. And this is where the online tool that I mentioned comes in that, uh, you know, with that new responsibility on the, the client, the public sector body, in Adam's example, they are then using this online tool which um, tends to kick out, um, you know, uh, one result in lots of situations which is employment. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, that's been one of the real headaches with this is, is this sort of um, implementation and then usability of this online tool. Uh, we've got um, another one here. How did the public sector take on your solutions? Um, I think quite. I think quite well. Um, there was one. There's one example of a, of a, of a big organisation who had um, in line of um, 400, 400 contractors, and I think their initial reaction was that um, uh, you know the, 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 they would have to move them all to. Uh, PAYE and, and, and a number of them wanted to move because of because of that, um, and obviously the cost there would be a you know cost increase to the organisation, um, and actually once once we had uh, ran an audit and ran a number of uh, tests with them and, and we and we use a typically use a, uh, or supported sorry by a third party um, advisory business on this so it's not a um, it's, it's not via the HMRC checker. It was deemed that actually 85% of them um, were, were fine to be continually engaged as they were. So um, it was only 15% sort of, of the contractor population actually had to move to 
um, um, to operating as a as a as a as a, as a PAYE. Um, so um, so I think after we've done that piece of work for them, we act as an MS an MSP provider for them. Um, so um, the um, you know, the solution will uh, work, work well. Uh, the next question we've got is based on the lessons learned today. How would the public sector implement the changes around IR35 um, uh, differently? Um, well, you know, hindsight's a, 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 fi a fine thing, and I think it was difficult for the public sector in the sense that you know they were, they were the first to see it. Um, uh, you would argue potentially they're more cautious in terms of in terms of or can be in terms of risk profile. Um, and they had a short time frame to, to, you know, to, to, to come in with. But I think, um, you know, we saw the public sector into three bodies, really, as organizations. One of them, uh, the, first, uh, the first set only would hire PYE workers, um, which, was, which was dangerous because they, they, they then became organizations that were known not to, not to bring on board um, uh, contractors, PSC workers. Uh, there was a second group that would only um, higher uh, PSC workers by exception only, and I think the third set of organisations actually utilised the, I suppose the, the rules under IR35 as we think it was it was it was meant and, and, and approached it in a, a fairly um, independent way, and I think um, and I think that would be the advice into you know into into you know into the into the private sector you know seek seek advice and support on this. Um, and don't you know go in with um, you know don't go in with um, um, you know with blanket rulings. We've had a question come in about the Taylor review. Um, where can I find the full 53 recommendations? Bearing in mind, Adam, that um, quite a good number of those are not particularly exciting. But where can we find them? Um, well, good question. So, short of reading the report itself, if you if you Google um, the Taylor Review, there is a government page where the, you can find the report, um, and there is also a summary which contains the full 53 recommendations in a separate document. Um, the other place to look here is um, the government's response to the consultation, which is is, is called government's good work um, response. So, uh, again, there's a, there's a government page on the BIS website um, that contains all of that. So there's a question here about the online tool. Um, is this already in place for the public sector? There is, there is a tool or, um, that, that's called Check Employment Status Tool for tax purposes, um, which is in place. And, and that tool is used particularly in the public sector in relation to the IR35 rules, but actually that tool is at the moment designed to be used for both public and private sector. It, it just happens to be the case that it's used more commonly in, in the public sector. Okay, so a nice thorny question for us here, Adam, about uh, mutuality of, of obligation. So on the employment status consultation, there's consideration given to whether mutuality of obligation is still relevant test of status. What are the panel's views on this? Well, we could talk for hours on this, frankly, mm. but um, <laughs> in a nutshell, um, within the world of sort of employment law test of status, mutuality of obligation has um, a rather more sort of meaningful um, sort of connotation and meaning, and Adam can perhaps summarize that for us in a moment. In the world of tax, it's slightly more nuanced as, well as, as to what it actually means. Um, but, but um, you know, the, the consultation does go into it and, and rather assumes that in respect to some of the worker, worker categories, it's a rather more straightforward concept than perhaps it is. Absolutely. So just to, to, to explain what we, we mean when we're talking about mutuality of obligation, this is simply um, the quid pro quo that you see in an employment or any other relationship. At its very, very minimum, um, mutuality is an obligation on the individual to work and then an obligation on the, uh, the company, the employer, to, to pay for that work. Um, now, I think part of the problem with mutuality is, um, as Ed said, there's, a, there's almost a different view in the tax world taken to the employment world. Now, for employment rights purposes, um, a lot of employment rights uh, depend on continuity of service. So you're looking at whether there's mutuality of obligation, not just at the time when someone's working or some, someone's on an assignment, but you also need to look at whether there's mutuality between assignments. So um, if someone is not on an assignment but um, the, the company offers that individual work, would they be obliged to accept it? 
Um, and if, if they are, then there would be um, mutuality and there would be continuity of service. So things like unfair dismissal rights, redundancy pay rights only kick in after two years service. In the, in the tax world, um, the government seems to take the view that um, you're only ever looking at mutuality when somebody is on an actual assignment and where there's an obligation to pay for work done, then you have um, a basic level of mutuality um, sufficient for an employment relationship. We think that's perhaps an oversimplification. Um, mutuality is, is quite um, a, a complicated concept and um, it, uh, it, you know, there are various different shapes and forms it takes. But we think there's got to be more than just simply an obligation to do work and an obligation to pay for that work. For the please don't, to so, sorry to interrupt uh, there, Adam, but, but please don't think we've got it in for this, this online tool that's come in for the public sector of payroll rules. But certainly one of the big criticisms there has been that that very simplified view is effectively taken. Indeed, the online tool doesn't really consider mutuality of obligation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certain eminent minds think that that, that perhaps renders the tool, um, you know, not meaningless, but certainly defective in terms of not considering one of the key components of a status test. Um, and certainly to date, the government's response on that has been that, well, they're taking a more sort of limited low-level view, perhaps the prevailing tax view of mutuality of obligation, i.e. if there's a contract, there's mutuality. But of course, that's not the full picture, as you say, and there are certain tax authorities which suggests you need rather more than just the contract for mutuality. Mm. So that is a real live topic. It's addressed to some degree in the consultations. There seems to be a prevailing view that it is the rather more limited concept, but our view is that that isn't really the full picture and certainly not when you're looking at the employment category. I appreciate that's all very complicated. Yes. It's complicated. It's hard to simplify it much more than that. Just, just to come back to your original question, though, what, what's the future of mutuality? I mean, I think that there is, reading between the lines, a bit of a move away from re relying on mutuality of obligation um, because it is such an um, a ambiguous concept. Um, I think the government will be looking to focus on things um, more like the level of control um, and the level of dependence the individual has um, on, the, on the company when determining employment or worker status. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you, gents. Um, there are a couple of other really specific questions, and the answer to those is it depends, because you've asked us really uh, specifically about your particular business. So um, there's questions that we would need to answer back. So. Um, uh, we will contact you personally with regards to uh, assisting in that because it's not the right forum uh, for that now, but thank you for the question. Um, clearly, uh, it's a big topic. IR35 is coming out quite strongly uh, in this discussion. Um, so um, the um, recording and the slides will be available, and we will um, put those on our website, and we will inform you of when those are alive. Uh, we have one more question come in. I oh, know we've answered that one. Okay, so we've done that. Um, so I would like to thank Adam and Ed uh, from Travers and Jeff uh, from Hayes, and thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you a good afternoon.